This is American Beauty, a podcast about the difficult but beautiful work of democracy in our moment. I'm Joanna Brooks. If you feel like something is at stake right now, something much deeper than winning and losing elections, you're not alone. Democracy is about how we live, talk, think, and fight with each other. It's everyday work, and a lot of it is done by women. This podcast amplifies the voices of women like you who are doing the work now and the voices of women experts who can help us see more clearly and get grounded for the work that lies ahead. Episode two, I worry that democracy is in danger. What do I do now? Part two. In part one, we met Shannon Bradley, who was so impacted by the November 2016 presidential election that she made a decision to leave behind a career she loved and go to work full-time in grassroots activism. But now it's all consuming. I just think about it all the time. I worry about it all the time. I read the paper in the morning and I'm horrified and all day long, even when I'm doing my work stuff, if I, you know, go online quickly, see what's going on and one more thing. And I thought, oh God, I can't. You know, that feeling, that surge of energy, the pressure, you just have to do something. It can be paralyzing or it can be a beginning. What do we call it? What do we do with it? How do we live with it and work with it day after day? In 1899, the American novelist Kate Chopin called it an awakening and wrote about it in her most famous novel, in which a woman named Edna Pontellier, newly alert to the constraints of gender roles, was so distraught, so overwhelmed, that she walked into the ocean and drowned herself. Distraught, overwhelmed, flooded, drowning. A lot of us felt that way after November 2016 but we know that walking into the ocean isn't going to do it. It's not going to get us one step closer to democracy or freedom. That's going to take a different kind of story, a different kind of awakening, a story of work, engagement, and resilience day after day. Good news, we have that story too. Hi, my name is Shirley Moody Turner. I am an associate professor of English and African American Studies at Penn State University. I work in African American literature and literary history and print culture studies. Professor Moody Turner studies the life of Anna Julia Cooper, a contemporary of Kate Chopin, who was one of the most important educators, civil rights activists, and black feminists in American history. Born into slavery in North Carolina in 1858, she graduated from Oberlin University and went on to become first a teacher and then principal of the most esteemed secondary school for African Americans of the day, Dunbar High School in Washington, D.C. And she was just getting started. She went on to write what became one of the most important statements of Black feminist thought, um, A Voice from the South. She published that in 1892. She lectured nationally and internationally on um, combating racial injustices and sexism, on analyzing systems of oppression. She founded a host of Black advocacy and community organizing groups in Washington, D.C. And in 1925, she, when she was 66 years old, she went on to earn um, her Ph.D., from the Soborn University of Paris. Um, She was only the fourth Black woman to do so um, when she was about 72. (laughs) Yeah, when she was 72. Move over, Alexander Hamilton. This woman was nonstop. (laughs) Yeah, she kept working her whole life. Um, she She went on to work with a Freeling Housing University, which was a kind of group of community schools in Washington, D.C., um, meant to service populations, working populations in D.C. that couldn't kind of attend Howard because they were working during the days. When Cooper was 100 years old, in honor of her own centennial birthday, she set aside funds to publish a book of her own writing. You know, she has this long, long career um, of writing, publishing, community work, activism, all on behalf of, you know, African-Americans. She died in 1964 at 105 years old. I asked Professor Moody Turner, was there a moment when Anna Julia Cooper woke up or being born into the situation she was, was she always that way? I think she was always woke, (laughs) you know. 
she calls it um, the stinging something. She says there's this stinging something that resides in the soul of of people, but also particularly for like marginalized and impressed people, um, this kind of yearning for freedom and self-determination pulls you forward. It draws you out. Um, and she talks about that happening kind of at the individual level. So like one individual may feel this need to be free, but that once it's kind of realized and actualized, it connects up with like broader collective action. And that's critical. It might be bumping up against an individual disappointment or injustice that wakes us up, but it's where we go from there that matters. It's moving from the individual to the big picture. And for Cooper, it started with her own deeply seated hunger for education. When she was uh, quite young, um, going to school, and she talks about, you know, that she had this kind of thumping within her that spurred her on um, to pursue her education, that she always wanted to learn more. Um, she wanted to be engaged in, in ideas from a very young age. But so she so it was there. It was this innate, inherent yearning. But she very early on was kind of corralled away from um, taking what were called the men's classes. And so she had to, she actually began, you know, her activist work at that time and had to petition for her right to take the quote unquote men's classes, the high, you know, the religion, mathematics and so on. You know, she could have very easily said, you know, I'm going to petition for this and get myself a seat at the table. And then that that's great. Right. We're done. But instead she sees it as like, okay, there is a systematic problem here that needs to be addressed. We need to challenge the system and I need to create more opportunities for other black women who may want, you know, who may have the same desires and are running up against the same limitations. She was very clear that doing the work required two movements at once, critical thinking, big picture analysis on the one hand and pragmatic action on the other. Like two, she says, okay, ideologically, we need to understand why this is a problem theoretically, but we also need scholarships for women. <laughs> we also need funding. And we also, you know, so she was always kind of connecting this need to critique and analyze the system with like, okay, but we actually need real material resources. And how did she keep going for so long? In 1930, so she's probably what, 72, I I think at the time in 1930, she's interviewed by um, Charles S. Johnson for Opportunity Magazine. And they ask her all these questions about her life and her work. <laughs> they have this one thing that says, briefly, give us your racial philosophy. And there's like a little thing for like four lines. And so she writes her racial philosophy and it covers those four lines and then the entire backside of the page. You know? <laughs> and she ends with saying, you know, I am grateful that my life has always been the kind that has beckoned me on and that I have, you know, I haven't had time for blase philosophizing. But it had just enough opposition to kind of give zeal to the struggle. And so she, you know, she was kind of always spurred on to keep doing her work. Opposition fuels zeal. I asked Professor Moody Turner about how Cooper dealt with the opposition, disappointments, and setbacks, because surely in a life of more than a century, she'd faced more than a few of those. Professor Moody Turner recalled that in 1905, Cooper was fired as the principal of M Street Academy in Washington, D.C., a remarkably successful school for African Americans that was sending students to the Ivy League and hosting lectures by the likes of the great American philosopher W.B. Du Bois. But people in power didn't like Cooper's way of getting things done. So she ends up getting kind of excommunicated. She goes out to Lincoln, Missouri. She's out there for five years away from kind of her network of support. And I think that was the hardest time um, because she had been doing such amazing work in Washington, D.C. She was integral to the community of Washington, D.C. And then to see her, especially as a black woman, you know, be kind of victim to all of the different kind of political machinations that were happening in D.C. and to be exiled in that way. I think that was a really challenging um, period for her. But she made it through and, and ended up coming back to D.C. For, for the remainder of her life. What kept her going during these hard times? There's this myth of Cooper as being a kind of lone, isolated figure. 
the iconic, separate, different, exceptional. Um, and she was exceptional, but she was not isolated in this way that this kind of myth has, has constructed her to be. And I her networks of support were critical, absolutely critical. And I think both in the real material sense of, you know, there were people that she lived with at different, she lived with the Grimkeys at, at different periods. You know, there were, they supported each other in very real ways, but then also locating herself within the black women's club movement. Like she wasn't alone doing this work. There were lots of people doing this work. There were lots of people, um, Pauline Hopkins, Mary Church Terrell, Ida B. Wells, who were all going through similar kinds of struggles, who were all reached very public, visible points in their career and all received a lot of backlash. It wasn't her, right? Like when she was excommunicated to Lincoln, Missouri, you know, she had seen Pauline Hopkins get pushed out of her editorship at Colored American Magazine, right? By the same Booker T. Washington, Tuskegee Machine was at work in both of those. You know, Mary Church Terrell wasn't getting her work published. Ida B. Wells had gotten pushed out of the NAACP, you know, her been marginalized, I should say, push up. So I think there was a way in which it helps you understand this is part of the systematic operations that I'm challenging. She lived with, associated with, and talked with other women doing the work. She knew she wasn't alone. When she had struggles, she could check in with others who were going through it as well. And she knew she wasn't alone in history. She connected her struggles with people who had gone before, with people, you know, she did work on the Haitian Revolution and really understood, you know, what it meant for Black people to assert agency, to be agents of social change. Oberlin at St. Augustine's um, in D.C., the Episcopal Church, the Black Women's Club Movement, Dunbar High School, like all of these institutions had really deep service ethos. Also, she put herself professionally in institutions that were about making change. That's something we can learn from her. It's easy to feel disconnected, isolated, going about daily chores and tasks so removed from things we worry about and care about. In these spaces where it's like we've all agreed not to talk about things that matter most. But keep connected. Keep connecting. Don't feel that you're alone. And what other advice would Anna Julia Cooper have for us now? Yeah, I think she would, she would quote Angela Davis. <laughs> She would say freedom is a constant struggle, but this is, this is what we do. This is what we do. And one more thing, keep relating, keep moving, and don't get bogged down in divisiveness. I think, well, I think one of the things too for Cooper is that she really did believe that dialogue and difference were critical to a healthy democracy. And so You know, it's a shame that there's so much divisiveness because even opinions that are so different than ours, they can be heard, but not when things get shut down. And and oftentimes these very range of opinions shut dialogue down. So I think that we have to be very careful about, you know, about protecting our freedom of press, freedom of speech, um, about making sure that we keep dialogue open, um, are talking to each other. Um, I think she would also say there are there are so many things out there, you know, ways to connect with people doing this work. Um, so I think about Kimberly Crenshaw um, and the hashtag say her name and the work that she's doing. Um, you know, Black Lives Matter. I think about young people who are running for office, you know, and taking over local politics. And so there's ways this work is happening. And so if we connect with that and, you know, think about ways we can help support, then we don't have to be doing it alone. Understand that loss, even big, painful loss, is part of the process. Black women who were working in the Black Women's Club movement at the end of the 19th century, they had just seen the Supreme Court decide that Blacks and whites did, weren't weren't entitled to the same kinds of um, services. They had just legally sanctioned segregation, right? (laughs) You know, and this is what, you know, Cooper and Chestnut and Dunbar and all these people have been fighting against. And quite frankly, in 1896, they, they lost that fight. 
And so think about that moment, you know, and so, and they had to keep working and they had to keep finding ways. Um, I think Cooper was really a both and, and she would say that to us today, you know, that you keep finding ways to support your community locally. You know, they were very much about, you know, how do we do work for ourselves to make sure that the most neglected and most vulnerable among us are protected and then how do we continue to critique and challenge and transform the larger system and structure? And I think she really saw that both of those things needed to be happening. Keep your eye on the big picture, but don't hesitate to get in and do the everyday work wherever it is happening close to you. It doesn't have to solve everything, but even local efforts put you in relationship with others. And those relationships are the heart of democracy. You know, I think about Toni Morrison, who was like, I couldn't be involved in the civil rights movement in that kind of very public, active way because I had small kids. So I wrote my books, you know, like what, <laughs> so, so thinking like, what is it? What is the way that one can, um, you know, make an impact where, wherever they are? Anna Julia Cooper died in Washington, D.C. in February 1964. Just nine months later, but thousands of miles away, the state of Hawaii elected the United States' first woman of color to Congress. Her name was Patsy Matsu Takamoto Mink. Patsy Mink. And her story of awakening and work, resilience, and lifetime commitment is another one we can take a lesson from. I talk with filmmaker Kim Basford, who created the definitive documentary Patsy Mink, ahead of the majority. My name is Kimberly Bassford. I am a journalism instructor at Windward Community College in Kaneohe, Hawaii, which is on the island of Oahu. I'm also an independent filmmaker. Professor Bassford grew up in Hawaii, but it wasn't until she left for college on the mainland that she realized how important Mink was, that Mink was the first woman of color elected to Congress that she had been the co-author of Title IX, which mandated equal access to educational opportunities for women. Oh, why didn't I know that, you know, that she was such a trailblazer? I just thought of her as this, this, you know, this um, political figure from Hawaii. I kind of thought of her on a local scale, Um, Mm -hmm. even though I knew she was representing us in Congress. I didn't really think of her as a national figure. And so I didn't know that she had, she had blazed the trail Like Anna Julia Cooper, Patsy Mink had a long life energetically pursuing the well-being and democratic rights of her community. Where did it come from, I asked Professor Basford. How did Patsy Mink wake up? She traces it back to Mink's birthplace on a Maui sugar plantation. Hawaii was a sovereign indigenous nation for a millennia before its colonization by the United States, she explains. And U.S. interests established plantations there and imported laborers from Japan and elsewhere in Asia to work and live on plantations, albeit in racially segregated camps. So Mm -hmm. Patsy Mink grew up uh, on a sugar plantation in Pa'ia, Maui, but she was a little bit different because her dad was not a laborer. Her dad was actually a surveyor, so he had an education and he was, you know, almost like middle management. And, and so that was the environment she grew up in, which I think was really unique. And I think that probably informed how she saw the world because she did see that there were many different groups, many different people. Um, and as kids, I think they all interacted to some degree. You know, they all went to the same school. And, and there was some pride in the different ethnic groups. And there was also the sense of they were all part of this plantation. But so that was kind of really cool, I think, you know, seeing this somewhat, I don't know if it was democratic, but seeing all these different groups and working together. But at the same time, I think it was, she was very aware of the fact that her dad um, was never able to rise in the ranks above a certain level, basically because he was Japanese. Huh. And at that point, like I said, it was, you know, Portuguese and Caucasians. I mean, it's funny because right. they, they separated the Portuguese from the rest of the Caucasians in Hawaii. But I mean, that was, that was, you know, if you wanted to, to rise up, you know, it was really, the color of your skin was kind of, was a big deal. On the plantation, she saw both community and racial segregation. She witnessed and absorbed her father's frustrations with upward mobility. She also absorbed a healthy sense of democratic ideals and processes. Yeah. But she grew up listening to FDR's fireside chats. She grew up going to rallies on the plantation as people were starting to form and try and 
you know, create sort of labor movements and whatnot. So I think she was kind of exposed to the sort of discourse. And in the schools, actually, there was a lot of this sort of civic education that uh-huh. it just seemed like they really ate up at that point because Hawaii was not even a state, right? This is, this is, we're talking about Hawaii as a territory of the United States. At times, she saw those democratic ideals and processes fail badly. She saw Japanese Americans, like herself, put in internment camps during World War II. And when she went to the University of Nebraska in 1947, she was assigned to a racially segregated dorm, the International House, even though she was a citizen. She didn't take it lying down. She actually started this letter writing campaign and and, in which she wrote letters in the paper or editorials talking about how you know, there shouldn't be racial segregation and whatnot. And, and eventually, actually, the University of Nebraska desegregated um, the dormitories. I think, you know, in part, she was part of that movement. So hmm. that happened to her. And then what she really wanted to do with her life wasn't to go to law school. Her lifelong dream was actually to be a medical doctor. So right after college, she applied to medical school. And, uh, you know, she applied to more than a dozen. And she was rejected from all of them. So she decided to go to law school and got into the University of Chicago on the foreign student quota. She hit barrier after barrier, and to each she responded with courage and action. I just think hearing FDR's fireside chats and really, Hmm. you know, that idea of American democracy and you can push the society forward through sort of collective action. I I don't know. I think it was just something she believed in from very young, that... Yeah, she didn't just accept the status quo. But to tell the truth, there were moments of sadness and loneliness as well. It's something every trailblazer has to live with. Professor Basford talked at length with Mink's daughter, Wendy, who described times of intense sadness around the house, and then how her mother would regroup. For example, when she lost her congressional seat, she went home and ran for city council. Oh, she loved it. I mean, she loved... Being at that level, like at the city level, you are really, you know, you're talking about people's day-to-day lives, like sewers and roads and things like that. And she really likes kind of knowing. And I think by being sort of on the ground, she got a better sense of like what the issues were. I, I think it really re-energized her. And, and she she took it very seriously. And constituents would tell me stories about, oh yeah, they would write to her and they would get a letter back. And then they would meet her in person and she knew their situation. So, you know, you might think, oh, she just had a great staff who was like writing back, but she read everything and she knew. And so when they would talk to her, they would be surprised, like, oh my gosh, you actually, you actually did read my letter. Hmm. Um, And so, yeah, and I didn't get to put that as much into the film as I wanted to, but I think she got a lot of strength from just talking to people and sort of being on the ground. And I think that that kind of helped her when she had those low moments we were talking about, you know, going back to like, why am I here? Who am I here to represent? Because I think when you have those blows, that's kind of a blow to your ego. But then when you go back to like, why am I here? I'm here as a public servant. Then, you know, and she realizes that people are benefiting from the things that she's doing. I think that gave her the strength. Throughout her career, As she faced multiple intersecting forms of prejudice, being in touch with her constituents at the grassroots was her anchor and her nourishment. That sense of belonging and connection to a people, to a place, Hawaii, kept her alive. And I think a lot of that goes back to that sort of plantation community in which she grew up, where there were those strong connections with, you know, they were, you know, a lot of them are just laborer families who are laborers, even though her, her dad was a surveyor. So that's why I really feel like there, there's something there that from her childhood that kind of that helped form who she was and that carried her through. That sense of closeness of belonging somewhere to a place and to a people, it's powerful and it's nourishing. I think that is something we lose in terms mm-hmm. of big scale electoral politics these days. We forget. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it becomes divisive. And I think we start seeing each other as other, you know, and it's, it's hard to figure out how to bridge the gap. But I think especially for Patsy Mink, she got a lot of her energy from these communities she really felt she belonged to, whether it is Asian Americans or just Hawaii as a whole, really, was, was who, what, she, what she loved. It's easy to lose sight of home and anchors and the things that keep us alive. 
we're facing big-scale electoral politics, when we're navigating the disorientation of the digital world, it's easy to lose sight of the importance of connecting. So I wonder, what would Patsy Mink say to us now? You know, I, I mean, I think she would also be discouraged and frustrated, but I'm certain she would be continuing to do the hard work. I mean, I think she would definitely advocate for people to stay involved in whatever way they can. So whether that's on the local level, whether that's just getting up and voting, whether that's, you know, volunteering for a politician you believe in, I think she would say to stay involved. And she would say, I mean, I think she was the kind of person, she was not afraid of hard work, you know, and I think she would, yeah. she would tell us that, you know, it takes hard work. I think she would probably um, refer, refer, refer back to her own career. I mean, there's losses and there's gains, right? There's ups and downs. It's a long game and it's not going to be a straight line. You know, the two steps forward, one step back. Sometimes maybe two steps back, but um, <laughs> you just got to keep going. Yeah. I think that's exactly what she would, she would remind us of. Keep going. That's what she did through a remarkable career that included co-authoring Title IX and being one of the first members of Congress fully out in favor of LGBT equality. She stayed in Congress until she was 74 years old when she was taken too soon, still in office, by complications from pneumonia. Anna Julia Cooper and Patsy Mink woke up early to the fact that there's a big gap between our democratic principles and the realities of American life. A big gap. And they lived their whole lives working across that gap, through it, trying to change it, hitting obstacles, resting, repairing, and reconnecting. Some of us, especially in communities of color, have lived that gap viscerally for a long, long time. And some of us, like Shannon Bradley, despite our best intelligence and intention, only viscerally woke up to it in November 2016. Once you feel its reality, it changes you and it can move you into action, into education and organizing like Anna Julia Cooper, or into electoral politics and legislation like Patsy Mink. But I think they both would want us to know there's not just one right way to live in that gap and to work it. My name is Regis Fox. I'm an assistant professor of English at Grand Valley State University, and that's in a small town, Allendale, in the state of Michigan. Professor Fox studies the many, many everyday ways African-American women, including Anna Julia Cooper, have lived in, survived, and worked across the gap between democratic principles and American realities. So I think that there is an, there can be this overemphasis on um, public forms of protest. Oftentimes that's about perceived radicalism, right, or a certain militancy, right? So that urgency is shown through a lot of times charismatic male leaders, right, that stand at the forefront. Think of a Martin Luther King or someone like this, right, standing at the forefront, urging us to kind of craft change. Um, and all of that can work and be great. Um, but I'm interested in thinking about what are these other ways that thinkers and activists can be engaged, right, that don't have to rely on that kind of narrow, um, often male model. We imagine people filling the streets. We imagine poster boards. We imagine speeches, and then we go home. And what next? What do we do every day with the energy? Is democracy something we visit downtown on Saturday during the Women's March? But I think there are other kind of ways around storytelling, around kind of information sharing, um, bridging kind of consciousness. Sometimes this is through social media, but sometimes it's through kind of direct kind of conversation. If we think about some of the writers that I'm that I'm looking at, Anna Julia Cooper, um, in her in her life and her writing, um, the way that she deploys sarcasm, right, is really important to kind of challenge the people in power over her to kind of rethink how the democratic process works. You know, she's she really engages music, which is something that's under de, huh. under kind of studied, I think, in her scholarship. So she uses kind of organizations and, and metaphor to use music to challenge this idea of reason that's so central to the liberal project. Um, and so huh. she, she says, well, you know, knowledge doesn't have to look one way. Resistance doesn't have to look one way. Right. Um, and so we can use some of these other strategies to, to do that. 
and holding up standards in our everyday lives, on the job, in our neighborhoods, in our relationships. Redefine. So Anna Julie Cooper, again, is someone who says, what if we look at civility as a kind of mutual respect that's grounded in sociopolitical awareness, right? So, um, and accountability, right? So just because you have a measure of privilege doesn't mean you are not accountable to other people who don't look like you. Um, and so she she's kind of redefining those very terms of the kind of civil subject that maybe some of these founding fathers, right, kind of mm-hmm. want us to think about. Insisting on the value of all human lives, not buying into the myth that if someone acts the right way, dresses the right way, gets all the right information, makes all the right choices and earns it, they'll get what they deserve. Because that's not always true. We need to work every day honoring the truth about the shortcomings of our society, amplifying the truth that our society doesn't always work for everyone. Professor Fox finds this in the writings of Elizabeth Keckley, a seamstress for Marion Lincoln. White Americans, in the time of Lincoln and later, loved to idealize the relationship between the First Lady and her seamstress as a friendship. But if we look at the writing Elizabeth, of Elizabeth Keckley herself, right, she's saying that, you know, on her lived day to day, she still has kind of economic obligations that she has to attend to. And their experiences are not the same. Their relationship to disempowerment, to um, kind of male powers in their midst are very different and say, in fact, right, I was being exploited as a laborer, right, by this, by this institution of power. I wasn't being valued as a friend, but in fact, I was being used. And so her kind of day-to-day work, working experience as a working woman was critical to, to challenging those norms that she was trying, trying to be ushered into by these kind of very powerful figures. Naming the truth, calling it out, and talking back with joy, humor, attitude, This is something Professor Fox finds in the writings of Harriet Wilson, who commemorated her experience as a black indentured servant in a book called Our Nig. It's meritocracy, right? She's working really, really hard, but she's she's devalued. She never is able to. She spends her whole life and then and then dies. Right. She never gets to this kind of stated ideal. Um, And so but still, as a child, right, she demonstrates this kind of ecstatic joy that pushes back against um, those who are in control of her labor. So even as, um, you know, it's and this is a narrative that's kind of part fiction, part memoir, so it kind of blends those barriers there. But every time her, Mrs. Belmont, her, her owner, tries to kind of break her down and really kind of demean her body, diminish her body, she kind of pushes back with these kind of moments of pleasure and joy, imagination and play right, that this dominant system really doesn't know how to process or deal with. And so she she can't really be beaten um, in in that way. And so I think that's a, that's something that's temporary. It's fleeting, but it's meaningful in her life and experience to say, um, you know, I, I, I am here. When you are pushing back with joy and courage, when you are telling the truth about the failings of the system, When you are networking, building relationships, telling stories, sharing information and perspective, holding people accountable, insisting on civility and decency, this is all part of the work. Taking the ups and downs, staying connected to your local community, even in small grassroots ways, this is what democracy looks like. And it's a long haul. And it's a long, long walk. And the women who walk before us, according to Professor Fox, would want us to leverage whatever we have and put it into the service of the work. So I think um, a major thing is taking your own privileges seriously, right? Um, and so those those might be racial, but they might be have to do with your religious faith, right? Or your kind of sexual identity, right? There are these other categories. So if you're benefiting in some way, how can you kind of take that seriously, Uh, take some risk, right? That maybe um, you have to give up some things for other people around you to thrive. I think that's the critical regard that that Anna Julia Cooper uses. Um, But you have to be willing to let go of some things to to release some benefits for a kind of greater good. Um, And I think that is inherently a liberal philosophy, right? That there's a greater social good. But what are you willing to do differently to make that happen?
And so I think I, I definitely, you know, in the wake of the election had to do some things, you know, I have a, you know, profess, I'm a professor, so I have a certain amount of privilege that I could duck my head in the sand for a while and kind of grieve what was happening. Um, and I had to kind of wake myself up and say, all right, now you've had enough time to be upset about this. Other people didn't have any time, right? They had to kind of immediately put their boots on the ground. And so we have to kind of release some of those things, I think. That's what this podcast is about. How do we pick ourselves up and keep going? How do we draw on our histories, deepen our ability to take risks, build our relationships and take refuge in them, find courage and joy and longevity in this work? Yes, call your elected officials. Yes, show up with your poster boards, but also recognize that democracy is the beautiful and challenging work we do every day. It takes this kind of traditional protest, but I think it takes thinking and analysis and storytelling, right, too, and joy and imagination and play, right? All of these things kind of together to, are going to be necessary because this is a big fight. This is a big fight. It's a big fight, and it's beautiful. You're not in it alone. In this podcast, you're going to hear the voices of women like Shannon Bradley, who are doing the grassroots work every day, and the voices of women like Professors Shirley Moody Turner, Kim Basford, and Regis Fox, who can give us perspective, big picture perspective, from history, from literature, and how we can stay in the fight day after day, year after year. There is so much we hear that eats away at hope, at resolve, but we have it in us. This is far from over. Let's walk this together. Subscribe and share with your friends and networks. Read Shirley Moody Turner's first book on Black folklore and the politics of racial representation from Indiana University Press. Order Kim Bassford's documentary, Patsy Mink, Ahead of the Majority, from the Japanese American Museum in Los Angeles. Regis Fox's first book, Resistance Reimagined, just came out in paperback from the University of Florida Press. Links are available on our website, AmericanBeautyPodcast.org.